have an Ask the Pastor question uh, that I'm going to answer today. I actually have several in the queue. Um, the, the, the question today is, is actually more of a statement. I think it's a typo. But it says, we will still have and be reading the Bible in heaven? Question mark. I'm going to reverse the first two words and say, will we still have and be reading the Bible in heaven? I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I have an educated guess, um, but scripture doesn't really speak to this directly. My feeling, my thinking on this is that the word that we have now is sufficient for now. But just as when God spoke to Moses and he had him build the, the tabernacle and all of the articles and the, the ark and the, the altar, and Hebrews tells us that these were a shadow, a copy of the things that exist in heaven. I think that's what our word is. This, this is a copy of what Jesus Christ really is. Because remember, he is called the word. Capital W. We have the word, little w, that is a reflection of him, and, and really what it should do is push us to him. So I believe that we will not need the written word in heaven because we will have the living word. Amen. Okay? Now, keep in mind that there is a heavenly tabernacle. As a matter of fact, we're, we're going to talk about that as we come to our conclusion on the feasts the Feast of Tabernacles, and, and how um, that will be fulfilled in the future. But the, uh, as to the Word, the written Word of God, I don't know why we would need that when we have the living Word. Okay? And that's my educated guess. Okay? Because God didn't make it clear in His Word. He didn't tell us, I think, because we don't need to know. You know, we have a lot of questions that a lot of time God just kind of shakes his head and says, you really don't need to know that. You, you don't, don't bother yourself with that. I think part of that is because our brains are too small. <laughs> okay? So this will be up here, a little bit longer description and some uh, scripture references. Um, <clears throat> so we are talking, we are up to the Feast of Atonement. And I shared with you last week that this has been, uh, this feast of all of them, has been very intimidating for me. I, I'm not really sure why. Um, I'm going to read to you. We're, we're going. Let's read uh, the passage here in chapter 23, and then we'll flip back to Leviticus 16. Okay, so we're going to pick up in verse 26, Leviticus 23, verse 26. Starts and says, "And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now on the tenth day of this seventh month." Uh, that's the month of Tishri, uh, is the day of atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation, and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. And you shall not do any work on that very day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that very day shall be cut off from his people. And whoever does any work on that very day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall not do any work. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. And it shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest. And you shall afflict yourselves. On the ninth day of the month, beginning in the evening, from the evening to evening, you shall keep your Sabbath. Okay? Okay. We spoke just a little bit last week as we kind of intro this. Um, there's, there's a couple of things that really jump out at us, jump out at me <clears throat> as I read over this. Uh, the, there, there are three things that I just want to point out to you. We'll get involved in a little bit more depth in them as we go on and, and in the coming weeks. Um, the first thing is that this day is set up to be a holy convocation. Okay? It's, it's a, a set-apart um, gathering okay we we are a holy convocation not because of, of 
anything that we have, but because God has given us the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ, that makes us holy, set apart, and a convocation is a gathering. Okay, and so we are a holy convocation. Um, because of that, there are two things that God says must be done. The first is that you have to afflict yourself. Okay? Now, this is one of the reasons why I don't really like that they, they name all of these things feasts. Because, uh, as we'll see later in the study, this actually is a day you don't feast. We have the idea of feasting, being eating and consuming food and celebrating. This, this actually of the days is a day that they didn't eat. Um, the, the word in the Hebrew for what that we translate as feast is actually it's, it's best translated as appointed times. Okay, so being that it is a day of holy convocation, they need to afflict themselves, and we'll get into what that affliction is a little bit later. But the second thing is that, that you do no work, okay? And, and um, you know, I, I think what is work is, is a little bit open to interpretation, <clears throat> obviously, because in order to make sure they did no work, <clears throat> the Jews came up with a whole list of things that would be counted as work. <clears throat> For example, you could carry your small child on this day. But if your child was holding a rock and you then carried your child, you were in violation of the Sabbath because you carried a rock. Okay? Um, <clears throat> I was so disappointed. I had heard from several people about the Shabbat elevators in Israel. Um, the Shabbat elevators are on, on Shabbat, on the Sabbath. You get on the elevator and it just opens the door at every floor because you're not supposed to push the button on the Sabbath. When they had a special elevator in, in the place we stayed in Jerusalem, the Shabbat elevator, and I was so excited. We were there on the Sabbath, and, and I got on, and it didn't do anything. I had to push a button. I didn't know who to gripe to. You know, it, it was just like every other elevator, and it even had the sign, Shabbat elevator. I was, I was so let down. <laughs> but they came up with a whole bunch of things to determine what is work, okay? Now, God just says clearly, do not do any work, all right? As, as part of that, um, God uses a word in relation to this Sabbath, or to this feast, that he only uses uh, in one other occasion, and that's calling it a Sabbath. All right, we go back up to the, the very first uh, verses of Leviticus 23, and the first feast is the Sabbath, that one day a week that you set aside, and because God did no work, and God knows how he designed us to work, he says on the seventh day you will rest. Okay, you will do no work. <clears throat> he calls that the Sabbath. Now, interesting, in this feast, the Feast of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, he calls this feast a Sabbath. It's the only time in Scripture that I'm aware of, outside of that, that one day of the week, that God refers to something as the Sabbath. Okay? Um, now, this is, this is part of where a lot of the confusion came in with the timing of the feasts, because when we were going through the spring feasts, there were two of them that were based off of the Sabbath, at a particular time. And some of the Pharisees, some of the, the Jews, the Pharisees in particular, took that to mean a day when they were supposed to do no work. Some of the feasts said, on this day you shall do no work. So they said, ah, that's a Sabbath. But the word actually only indicates two times that there is a Sabbath. One is the, the seventh day of the week, and the other is the Feast of Yom Kippur. And so the other group, the Sadducees, said, no, no, no. It's the, the, the seventh day of the week, the Saturday. That's the Sabbath that obviously God and Moses were referring to. And, and that led to a lot of disputation as to when these things should be celebrated. Thankfully, we don't have to worry about that. Okay? Um, they've all kind of settled on one particular day. Um, but, but we're to treat all days the same, aren't we? Now, that's not to diminish the feast days. It's to elevate the others. 
It's to bring them all up with the understanding that every day is a day to worship God. Every day is a day to celebrate God. Okay? So these things stood out to me. One, that, that it's a holy convocation. Two, that uh, you're not to do any work. Um, I'm sorry, to afflict yourselves. And three, you're not to do any work. Okay? Because it's this, a Sabbath. So let's flip back to Leviticus 20, or 16. <clears throat> now, how many of you did your homework? Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> Somebody didn't do their homework. And I won't tell you that it's Christy. <laughs> That's okay, she made my meals. <laughs> okay, so let me start off first by saying this. Um, I am working, as we go through this, the majority of the material that I'm looking at uh, is coming from uh, Dr. Fruchtenbaum. Um, he did, if you ever get the opportunity, uh, talk to Dennis and Jeannie. He did an incredible series on the feasts, uh, some, some great insight. There are several other authors that I will be adding to, but this is primarily coming out of his, his uh, writings on the Day of Atonement out, off of Leviticus 16. Okay, so I'm going to add some of my stuff in there, but this is the core of this is from Dr. Fruchtenbaum. Uh, just so anybody goes, hey, that sounds a lot like, yeah, that's because it is. Okay, so we're going to start off. Uh, hopefully you read chapter 16 because we're not going to read it today. Um, but I'm going to point out some things to you as we go through this. Okay, the first thing that, that uh, you see when you're looking at chapter 16, uh, verse 1, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they drew near before the Lord and died. Okay? Now, I do not believe that this is in here on accident. I believe that this is here with a purpose. Uh, God wasn't just throwing things out. We were, were working through um, his Genesis history uh, in the brothers' meeting. And, and uh, one of the things that we were studying this week is that as Moses was leading the people in the Exodus, God told him to write down every place that they stopped and to make notes. And that this would be a memorial. This would be so that the people would remember how God brought them out of Egypt, how God took them across the Red Sea, how God gave them the law, all the different places that God took them in their wanderings, why God took them, it took so long in the wanderings, and, and what God did during this all the way up to, uh, basically, they're standing at the Jordan ready to cross, okay? And, and each of these is done with a purpose. God didn't just do it down, tell Moses, hey, you know, you don't have enough to do. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to start logging mileage, you know? Keep a detailed journal just because, you, you know, uh, there's, there's 40 years with not a lot going on. God did that with a purpose, and I think a lot of that purpose is so that when we are looking back, and we are, I thought he was coming, um, <laughs> we can see as archaeology, as science is working to show us what has come before, we can see how God's word lines up and what really happened so that as we discover things, we can reaffirm and feel more surety that God's word is true. Okay? When God says they were at this place, and we find that place, we, we can go, ah, okay, now we see it's coming together. Um, if you get the opportunity, I would encourage you, there's a, a video out, I, I can't remember if it's on Amazon or... or uh, Netflix. It's called Exodus um, Patterns of Evidence. Is that right? Patterns of Evidence? Yeah. Uh, excellent, excellent video series talking about 
um, the, the whole, the Jews coming into Egypt, the time that they were there, and their departure, and how a lot of archaeologists and a lot of scientists say it couldn't have happened because there's no uh, representation of these people coming in and growing up, and then this mass exodus of them leaving. Um, it, it absolutely amazes me because the number one proponent for the biblical story, the, the number one guy in the video that's going, yeah, this had to have happened, is an atheist. And he's looking at the Bible for archaeological purposes and going, whoa, 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 whoa. You guys are saying it didn't happen because you're looking here. But if you read what it says carefully, it's not here, it's here. And if you start putting these pieces together, you see this is so. Yeah. So if you get an opportunity to see that, yeah. do that. Because God put things in his word that to us look innocuous. They, to us, they look kind of like, you know, our, our, we do the bleep over them because they don't mean anything to us. He put them there to prove his word. Okay? So, the first thing that God does here is he says, uh, he gives us a time. And he says that uh, God spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. Now, if you remember the story, Aaron's two oldest sons, uh, they took a censer and, and they put uh, fire in it that was not um, presented the way it should have been. And God struck them dead. Okay, because they approached the Lord, they approached his dwelling in an, in an unholy manner. They treated as common the things that should be treated holy. Or actually more accurately what should be said, they tried to take what was common and make it holy. Okay, and God struck them down. Okay, now he starts off this passage by letting us know why this is coming. Okay, basically he's telling us everything that follows is because of this. Right? So we look down here in, in uh, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 2 says, And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark, so that he may not die. Uh, Josh, would you put that uh, picture up? This is actually the temple, uh, but the, the setting is the same as would have been in the tabernacle. Um, if you look up at the top, you'll see a, a little black or a white number one way up at the top of the illustration, and then a number two, a number three, number four. Uh, oh, this is the tabernacle. Oh, perfect, even better. Um, this is the when we were talking about the the copy of the things to come. God had very specific instructions as to how this was to be done. Okay, and and Moses took those instructions faithfully and gave them to uh, oh, Holy Adam, uh, Bel Bel him. Um, and then they made everything according to the instructions that they got. So if we look up at the, the, uh, the tent, the tent of the meeting, you'll see that there are a number of numbers there. And then as you come out, you'll see the, the brazen labor, the, the sea, uh, and then the brazen altar. Um, and then you see the doors down at the, the bottom right um, going into and out of the tabernacle. Now, when the temple was built, it was built on this same model. Okay? And it, it was bigger because there was more area, but it still had the, the court, the altar, the labor, and then going into the holy place, um, there were the menorah, the table of showbread, uh, the altar of incense, and then the veil, and then the most holy place where the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, sat, and the, the mercy seat was the cover of the Ark, okay? And, and then it was overshadowed by the two seraphim, with wings outstretched to cover the Ark, okay? And I, I want you to see this, because I want you to understand what's going on with these instructions that God is giving them. The first thing that he says after setting the time <clears throat> is he says, um, tell Aaron. Aaron is the high priest. And he says, tell your brother that he can't come whenever he wants into the holy place inside the veil. If you look up toward the top, you'll see number three. That's the veil. And it's woven uh, several layers thick that separated the holy place from the most holy place or the holy of holies. In the most holy place is where the presence of God dwelt above the mercy seat. And he's speaking to Aaron through Moses and he says, you can't come in willy-nilly. 
okay? This is the understanding, this is uh, something that we need to understand. When we come into the very presence of God, we can't do it lightheartedly. Okay? That doesn't mean we can't have joy. Yeah, we have joy. But you come in, man, it's a serious thing to come into the presence of the Almighty. Okay? And so, he says, you can't come in whenever you want. Um, I'm going to back up for a minute because I want to... We're talking about Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Does anyone know what atonement means? Covering. What's that? Covering. Covering, yeah. It's from the Hebrew word kapar, and it means to cover. Okay? Now, what's, what's interesting about this, um, this word kapar is the same word that is used, used in the story of Noah. Okay? When Noah builds the ark, God says to cover it with pitch on the inside, to completely seal it, so it'll be watertight. That's the same word, to cover, to completely cover. All right? So when we're talking about atonement, okay, we're talking about the sins being covered. Okay? An illustration of this, um, it was kind of funny when we were in Israel because depending on who was controlling the site you were at, you were either supposed to have your head covered or supposed to not have your head covered. Okay? If it was by the Catholics or, or one of the, the Christian churches that were putting it on, when you came in, you were supposed to remove your covering, your hat. Okay? But if it was by the Jews, you were supposed to cover your head. You were supposed to put that barrier, that symbol that, that there is a separation between you and God. Okay? This is the same understanding of what atonement is. It is to cover over your sin. Okay? So, kafar, remember that word. Uh, the idea by extension by understanding is that through this atonement you can reconcile two parties that were at enmity okay scripture tells us in the new testament that before christ before we accepted christ before we were redeemed we were the enemies of god okay now think about that for a moment um, let's put that in a light today. Um, who would you consider to be our enemies today? Come on, somebody just throw something out here. Muslims. 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 We look at Muslims, let's, let's say ISIS, let's say Hezbollah, let's say Abu... Um, oh, I just lost the word. Boko Haram. Yeah, Hezbollah. Um, we, we look at these... And we see them as being the enemy. Why? They hate us. They hate us. Okay. That's an excellent reason. Because we're infidels? Yep. Have, have we done anything particularly to offend them? No. Yeah. We're, we're not Muslim. Um, this same idea, take that and place it over yourself before Christ. You were an enemy of God. Even though he had done nothing to offend you, you were his enemy, and he was yours. He loved you. He longed to have a right relationship with you, but he couldn't accept you. He couldn't. And, and quite honestly, you wouldn't accept him at that point. That's one of the marvelous, amazing things about the work of the Holy Spirit, is that when it comes in, when it draws you, when the Holy Spirit brings you to Christ, it makes a fundamental change in who you are. What you could not do before, now you could do, and that's to accept the gift of salvation. Okay? So, the idea of atonement, the covering of our sins, is to reconcile and make right a relationship between two estranged parties. Two parties are at, that are at enmity with one another. Okay? So this is the idea that I want you to have in mind each time we address the idea of atonement. Okay? Um, so one of the interesting things that I didn't really realize until uh, I read it from Dr. Fruchtenbaum, um, the New Testament doesn't use the word atonement. Not in the concept of the way that the Old Testament does. It's, it's something that was unique to them 
And yes, Jesus Christ is the ultimate atonement, but that same idea has a different working in the New Testament because there, our sins are not just covered over, are they? They're not. They're completely removed from us. Okay? So we don't have to keep coming back you know, it's like that old house. You put a layer of paint on it, and guess what? In another few years, you got to put another layer of paint on it. That's what had to happen to the people of Israel with the Yom Kippur. Every year, they had to have a fresh coat applied. Okay? So, <clears throat> the understanding is that um, it was to cover their sins. It was to make right a relationship. Um, another thing that I want to address, and this is something that a lot of people kind of get confused. Yom Kippur is not a day of individual atonement. This is not the day where you come before God for your sins. Okay? When you committed a sin in Israel, there were a number of statutes, a number of laws in place that you were required to make that sin right. You had to bring a sacrifice. You had to bring it to the priest. You had to pay the price. And then the priest would, would offer the sacrifice and your sin would be forgiven. Okay, the Day of Atonement is the national sin. Okay, carried with that is the idea that it will affect the individual. Okay, because the Day of Atonement is not for the sins that are upcoming, it's for the sins that have already occurred. Okay, this is to get those sins covered. The idea being that on this day, if your sins have been covered, you have been righteous according to the law, and those sins that you didn't even know were sins, this covers that, and then you're good for the next year. Your name, remember, we talked about the three books. Yes? Um, it says the Day of Atonement was um, to cover the sins for the entire congregation. Yes. The sins of the nation. And what, what's interesting about this, and something you need to keep in mind, if you had willing sin in your life, this would not cover it. If you were living in rebellion, this sacrifice did not cover your sin. Okay, That's part of why we talked about with the Feast of Trumpets, the entire month of Elul, they prepared for the Day of Atonement. It was a, a time of introspection. It was a time, especially the ten days, between the Feast of Trumpets and the, the Feast of Atonement, they had to prepare themselves so that when the time came and that atonement was made for them, their names would be written in, in the, the Book of the Righteous. We talked about the three books, the, the righteous, the evil, and the, you're kind of somewhere in between. Okay? And this kind of somewhere in between, you could go either way. All right? So the idea being that this covered the sins for the year up to this point, you did that time of personal personal reflection. If there was a sin that you became aware of, you were responsible to go and make the sacrifice. And then on Yom Kippur, the sins of the nation of Israel were, were covered. Okay, so it was not about, well, okay, you know, one day a year I go and I just get all my sins covered. Uh-uh. You, you start looking into the law, every sin you committed required a sacrifice. We don't understand that because... Our sins have been paid once and for all. But Christ paid for our sins that we committed today and the ones we committed yesterday and the ones we're going to commit tomorrow. So we don't have this understanding of having to do the same thing over and over and over and over again. Okay? So Yom Kippur is a national day of atonement. All right? So, um, moving forward... One other comment that I want to make on the day, the general day, is that um, just as um, salvation is given for all, all sin was covered on the cross. But who then are those that are saved? The believers. Those who have faith. Okay. Even though ISIS, Boko Haram, Hezbollah, whoever, even though their sins were paid for at the cross, until the moment that they receive that, that by faith oh. they believe, oh. their individual appropriation goes unmet. 
Okay? So, even though Christ paid for all sin, he took the burden of all sin, you do not receive it until you receive it by faith. Okay? So, when people stand before God at the judgment, okay, and, and, and I understand there's going to be different judgments, uh, so don't, don't get all freaked out and come up to me after service and say, well, we as believers aren't going to stand under that judgment. Yeah, I know. I understand that. See, we've already been judged. We're judged by the blood of Christ. But when they stand before him, if there is no blood of Christ, then they have nothing to pay for all of the sins that they have committed. Okay? And they are punished according to their sins, according to their separation from God. So, just as that is the case today with us, the, the Day of Atonement was for all people, but it had to be individually appropriated. You had to make sure you were right before God. You had to come to him prior to this and, and made yourself right and acknowledged your sin, acknowledged your failures. And then when the, the, the offering was given, then you were, your name could be written in, in the book of the righteous. Okay? So even though it was for the high, all the people of Israel, it was only really received by those who took it. Okay? So... Those are the things I wanted to say as we get into this. Um, <clears throat> just going to hit a little bit more here. Um, we looked at verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. Uh, if you back up into chapter 10. I'll let you guys look at this later. You will see that whole incident with, with uh, Aaron's sons and, and they're offering uh, the unholy fire and, and they're paying the price for it. Now, a lot of people go, wow, God is really harsh. We look at examples throughout scripture uh, when, when David was bringing the ark in on the cart and it started to fall and the, the man put his hand up to steady it and God struck him dead, we go, wow, God is harsh. Um, when Moses and Aaron uh, were told to, to uh, speak to the rock and the water would come out for all of the people of Israel, and, and Moses didn't, he struck the rock, and, and God said, hey, you can't enter the promised land. This is your punishment. Uh, as a matter of fact, later in the story, you find that Moses is talking to God about this, and, and God says, hey, I've said it enough. No more talking about it. I don't want to hear it again. Okay? You struck the rock. You're not going into the promised land. I will let you see it. I'll let you go up on the mountain. And, and, and when you see, God showed him the whole land that stretched from the Euphrates down to the desert, from the Mediterranean, over into the, the eastern parts, east side of the Jordan River. And he, God, the scripture says he saw it all. It says that when God took him home, he was full of life and energy. He had, had he was still in good health, 120 years old. Okay? And God said, your time's done. I'm going to gather you to your people. And then God buried him. Scripture says that God buried him. No one knows where his, his grave is today. I think God did that because he knew that the people of Israel would then deify Moses. They, they would come to worship his, his tomb. Okay? So... Um, <clears throat> back up to chapter 10 we have these five intervening chapters and then it's like God tags right back to chapter 10 so he's establishing a link between chapter 10 and the goings on there and chapter 16 as for the day of atonement and what God expects how he expects that the tabernacle specifically the holy place and more specifically the most holy place is going to be dealt with by the priests and, and, and really, by extension, all the people of Israel. Okay? So I'm going to stop there for today. Uh, we got one verse covered. <laughs> all right? That's why I was telling you last week, I don't know how long this is going to take. We're actually going to do them in sections of verses. Uh, so we'll, we'll hit several verses at a time and deal with them, and then we'll go to the next batch of verses. Uh, Father, we thank you.